Hello, and welcome to Jason Cavanis Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cavanis. Our guest today is Sherry Foos. Sherry, are you ready to be great today? Yeah. Sherry is a marriage and family therapist, adjunct professor, and the creator of the Narrative Method, a California 501c3 nonprofit organization, part of the Human Connection Movement. The Narrative Method creates programs, products, experiences that address the growing isolation need for real connection through sharing stories. Sherry, thanks for being here today. I really, I really appreciate it. Oh, I'm so excited to talk with you. So first question, why are you a nonprofit versus like a, not a, for, a for-profit business? What, 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 why did you make that decision? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I feel that um, this is my life's work and this is what I want to give to the world. Um, I came from a very dysfunctional family. We were really poor. I don't mean to say that like we're the most impoverished people in the world, but I had that sense of myself. I really did want to make money. And, you know, so it just turns out that the, the paths that I followed didn't lead to that. Um, but my husband is successful and I've, I've gotten to learn a lot about what it means to manifest um, a way to a way to send your purpose, your voice, your gift to the world out there. And at the end of the day, the idea of impacting a lot of people is so much more important to me than making a lot of money. And so when I think about what it would mean, what it would have meant for me when I was younger to have something like this for free and you know, just available to everyone. Um, it, I, I just think it's, I'm just so proud to give this, that's all. I think what people get confused about, even though you're a nonprofit, you still have to rent it like a business, right? Pretty much nothing, everything's the same, right? Instead of the tax structure, right? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, there's, there's leeway in that because we're kind of on a shoestring. We do some things, you know, the best way we can, but yes, it's, it's business-like. Um, so one, I found something you said, uh, can, you, can you tell me what it means when you say building meaningful human connections? Can you define that for us? Yes. Um, well, based on the work of my life, which I started as, um, I started hosting these late night conversation and performance salons in the 80s. And I really have always loved bringing groups together. So what I think happens, as we were briefly discussing before we started, is that when you're with um, a group of people where you feel comfortable to be yourself and people start talking about like life and how hard it is with all these influences that we have. And, you know, everybody at times feels like, oh, I hate my life, but you kind of don't want to go around there around saying that. However, if you do, and you can be more specific, but I think we all kind of know that feeling of being bummed and overwhelmed. You, you bond so meaningfully with people when you tell the truth about stuff like that. And suddenly the weight of these things just gets somewhat lifted and it's a wonderful feeling. So radical human connection is all about creating an open line of communication, certainly with those with whom you're already involved but also just to like think of people you haven't met yet as kind of cousins. Most people aren't really gonna be dangerous, but they could be friends. Um, and so I just hope to move that notch just a tiny bit. What, what's your advice on this? Like suppose someone, someone's out there, right? You know, they say you're the, the combination of five people you're around. Let's suppose this person has five friends, they're toxic, you know, they're really negative. They're not doing any really good. He knows he needs to get he needs to get new, he needs to get new friends to get rid of him, but he's afraid of being lonely. Can you talk about that? Wow. So somebody who pushes people away, right? But is also afraid to be alone. My guess, you know, just in my therapeutic training, would be that this person might have been either actually abandoned or emotionally abandoned or perceived some incidents as abandonments, um, because why would you push away people who want to be close when you do want to be close, unless you were afraid of getting hurt? And why would you even think that getting close 
would lead to hurt unless something has happened to sort of set a foundational expectation like that. Yes. And how does like being an introvert or extrovert play in any of this? You know, I think most people have both parts. You'll see tons of introverts who are completely, you know, free and easygoing and life of the party with their close friends. I think that, you know, how we feel outside uh, has a lot to do with, um, and what I should say is how we express ourselves has a lot to do with how we feel. And especially when you're in a big place, you're getting lots of mixed messages. And even though you don't know what they mean, it could be somebody that you're not even looking at across the room and people that you pass on the street, there's all these vibes, you know, and, and they appear to us to be vague because there are too many for us to decipher. So it's easy to get overwhelmed by that. So in big groups, you may not warm up as quickly. Um, so before I would uh, give anybody any kind of a label, I would ask them to think about that. You know, is it that psychologically the definition is an introvert gets their juice from themselves? An extrovert gets it from other people. So we probably have some of that and where you lean can, can be part of your stage of life or it may be sort of the permanent balance. But I hate to put a limit on our futures based on how we've lived in the past. So random, random question. Can someone be an introvert and then become an extrovert and vice versa? Or once you're one, one, one thing, you're that for us, your life, or do you know, what do you think? I think, you know, I would say, yes, you can change, but I don't think anybody changes 180 degrees or 90 degrees or 45 or 22 or 11. But what I, what I like to think about, and I use this example in the rocket ship, which is one of the narrative methods, 12 core concepts. And the idea is if you imagine a rocket ship speeding into space at a zillion miles an hour and it changes its trajectory by one degree, it's going somewhere else. We can't completely change ourselves for zillions of reasons. And we, we wouldn't feel comfortable if we did really anyway. But one uh, significant shift, which always starts very incrementally, can have a big impact. So if you've always been an introvert, but maybe you just unwound some things that you found out, you know, you had never really paid attention to, which is that you had this belief that if you speak out loud, people will laugh at you and whatever, something just came to mind and you remembered this old story, you're able to say, Oh my God, I've been carrying through that belief since I was six years old and those kids laughed at me. So you can make those kinds of corrections and then, you know, incrementally feel more and more confident. And then you're starting a new habit. Sherry, can you talk about how this, what you're doing now has became your life's work, how, how you became so passionate about doing this? It really, I didn't have this form, but when I was a child, I was already developing this because I grew up in um, a situation where I didn't feel safe, I didn't feel seen or heard, and I really had to develop philosophies, you know, and, and ways of self-soothing. At the same time, I developed some nervous habits and tics and blah, blah, blah. Um, but it was my own need for coping skills. As I got older, I became a performer, and whether it was acting or singing or dancing, and I did all those things. It was a way that I could almost exorcise it, if, if you will, you know, like just get it out of my system. And then as I grew older, I decided to become a therapist because therapy had helped me. And after that, I studied narrative medicine. And that gave me an idea for a format that I could bring to the world that wasn't about pathologizing people. It was really just about looking at our culture 
and what we share, you know, and all the messed up messages and how they make us all feel the same way. And so that's kind of how it evolved. And Sherry, you've been doing this like around 20 years, right? Uh, depending on where you're counting, that's fine. Sure. So in those 20 years, can you talk about how, how, how you, have you grown as a person doing this and how your company has grown, like the changes and the uh, progress you made? Well, I will say this, that in the last year, since the pandemic, we've been doing our get togethers online. And I didn't know how that would be at first, but it's been mind blowingly great because we get people from all over and more people are available. Um, but the way I have seen a change in this last year is by truly practicing at a whole other level, one of the other 12 core concepts, which is called radical gratitude. And radical gratitude just means noticing and making a point of stopping every single time something amazing happens. For instance, you didn't get hit by a car. Instead of like giving the car the finger, it's like, oh my God, you know, go crazy, dance, spend money, you know, do apologize to somebody, whatever. And even if, you know, you didn't press send and then you thought, oh my God, that would have been the worst. Well, whatever it is, just celebrate that. And whenever you see something beautiful or a lovely thing happens, because if you do that, you will do it so often that you can't help but feel blessed and fortunate. So yeah, that really changed me. That's a great point. Um, I remember a few, uh, maybe a few years ago, I don't remember the time, there was this guy who was playing violin in the New York, New York City subway. People just walked by him, didn't, didn't do any, pay him no attention. Ended up, he was like the number one violinist in the world. He, he is like conscious sellout. And no one even paid me mind, right? It's um. Well, there. I mean, well, let me ask you this: What about that touched you? It, just the fact, you know, like this. I mean, someone at the top of his craft is doing a free concert, you know, and no one even knows it, right? It's just like, you know, are we too busy? People going back and forth to work. And you know, and that's, I think that night, the night before, he he played like sold out uh, Madison Square Garden, like tickets like a thousand dollars a piece. He's played in the Louvre, Vienna, like the, the top violinists in the world. Like nobody knows him, right? But why does he? But well, how, it, somebody's got to know him if he's playing the Louvre and and yeah. Madison Square Garden. I mean, he would dance by himself. Um, he was playing like a like a real expensive violin. Just no one noticed me. No, of course, you know, he didn't, he just went out and played. You know, he didn't like have a sign up or anything. And of course, I like, know I've never been to New York Subway, but I always say like you know, people like the performers and just people all the time, you know. So maybe just like, you know, run the meal day for them, I guess. I don't know. You know, I think you could do an entire show, more than one episode, on how profound that is to see people on the street being completely vulnerable, because it's not going to sound good unless you are, <laughs> and just putting themselves out there without letting them get distracted by the lack of attention or negative attention. People can taunt you, you know, but that's kind of like a real Zen activity, you know, if you're doing it to make money. That's that's tough, but I think it toughens you too. Yeah. So Sherry, can you talk about your 12 core concepts and like how did you come up with these 12? Yeah, sure. Well, the 12 core concepts really start with the problem. And to me, I think that everybody has had issues growing up, your parents, your siblings, your school, authorities, wh whomever. But we have in the past looked to those things as a way to understand our lives and to kind of make corrections. And all those things are valid. But I am more interested in this thing that has equal weight to all of those put together, which is the impact of the cult of culture. And that's one of the first concepts. The cult of culture just symbolizes the constant noise and negativity 
that comes from media, social media, advertising, you know, everything, all of these ways to sell us soap that we don't need, right? But in the process, tell us we're not good enough. And by the time we're a young child, everybody knows, you know, you know, you know, you're not pretty enough, strong enough, rich enough, cool and, you know, on and on. And those things become more and more distinguished through grade school and high school. And those ideas about ourselves follow us until we deconstruct them. So the reason I put together groups is because in groups, when you just talk about your regular stories, the stories of your life, people get to know each other and it's very interesting. We also do writing groups and that's interesting. But what really happens is because we're connecting deeply, we come to realize organically, just because of comments people make, that we all have this negative stuff all the time. It's very underground, so you don't even always notice it unless you're depressed. But there's always some voice reminding you that you're not good enough. You suck. Why did you do that? Again? Oh, you never, you know, nonstop. And so being with other people who are being real about that stuff is completely liberating. And you realize, oh, my God, I'm not crazy. I don't like it, but I'm not crazy. And that, that really helps everyone. So these Zoom calls, you do them every week, right? Yeah, we do about four. We also have classes, we work with companies. Yeah, we have all kinds of things. And are, are these, these Zoom calls someone signs up to do or you have to, you have to invite them? How does that work? How do people sign up for your Zoom calls? To take oh, just, part? just go to the narrativemethod.org and sign up for as many as you like. And so when someone signs up, what, what should they expect from these calls? Okay, well, um, we have two kinds, basically. We have three kinds. One is just like some random crazy thing we do periodically, always different. Um, on Thursday nights, we do, uh, it's called the Human Zoom-In, and we look at really interesting, it could be about any subject, um, uh, short videos that are usually mind-blowing in one way or another. And based on that, then I give everybody uh, a prompt. And that prompt is intended to make you think of a story, just a real story from your life. It's not that it's the best story, but we go into breakout rooms and in the breakout rooms, people share their stories. And it's like this magical, easy thing. You just, you know, look bad when you arrive, have food coming out of your mouth, just pretend you're with your family. And just in telling these stories, we get, First of all, the sense of being seen and heard when we tell our own, but also you really get to know people in a way that's fun. Like, I don't really care what your job is. I mean, yeah, it's interesting to know and I can find out later, but who you are and how you talk and your personal stories really become memorable. That's how our brains are designed to remember things through stories. So yeah. it's, a, it's a bonding experience. I'm a, I'm a big believer that everyone has a like unique story to tell, but a lot oh, yeah. of people don't want to tell the story, right? Because they're, you know, like you said, they're embarrassed about it or don't think it's important. How do we get more people to actually tell the story so they can want to know, let the world know where the great people they are, what they've been through in life? Definitely. I think, you know, just to let them know that the idea isn't to have an externally, you know, popular story. If you really think about the stories that have moved us, it's usually a personal quest to overcome something. And there's not a person on the planet who hasn't overcome something. Everybody has been hurt. Everybody has been insulted. Everybody has been in a situation where they were out of their league and so embarrassed by something. Everybody knows what it is to have a great time and to be joyous and, you know, good family, bad family. Regardless of the circumstances of your life, there's a certain amount of emotions and everybody gets them. So we can empathize with each other's stories, even if we haven't been in that situation. And if, for me, when I think about kinds of movies I love, they're always a small 
relationship story. You know, I, I don't care about action. I just love the depth of excitement for me that comes with understanding how people are thinking and feeling. And so that's what we, we do. And I think you get to discover yourself in another way when you realize this. Sherry, your trial core concepts, are they all equal or are there like ones more important than the other ones? Or that depends on the person or they're all like 12 equally the same regardless of the situation? It's such a cool question because I've thought about this so many times. I've put them in various orders. And the thing is, they all are a part of a whole. And they all interrelate. So, you know, we talked uh, about the cult of culture. Another one is who you really are. Who you really are means separate from all the junk that's happened to you and good stuff, all the stuff that's happened to you and all the things that you've been told about who you are and who you aren't and all the ways you've tried to make people happy or conform or do what you got to do to survive separate from all of that, who you really are. That's the goal. Because when you're connected to who you really are, you're also connected to what matters to you. And it's easier to get clear about your purpose and figure out a way to manifest that. Say so for the people you reach out to your nonprofit, is there a certain like demographic or is like, are you targeting like people who have been, you know, suffered through depression or mental health breakdown or someone who's like really lonely? Is there a certain like person you're trying to go after or it, it, whoever wants to come up can, can show up? Well, basically it's, it's really whoever finds um, it compelling. What we are not, we are not therapy and it's absolutely not a good place to go and, you know, complain. It's, those are not the stories that we're telling. We're, we're talking about incidents of our lives that are evoked by, you know, by these things that we see. Um, so that is not appropriate. Um, but if you are just somebody who is interested in connecting to other people, just in a genuine way through sharing stories and seeing interesting things or through a writing group, you don't have to be a professional writer, um, and then it's anybody, anybody who enjoys these things and is willing to do two things, mutual respect and confidentiality, which go hand in hand, which means whatever story someone tells you is their story, we can't retell it. And then the other thing is because we are sharing our stories and people can be vulnerable, everyone has to have their camera on. And that we just can't bend on. Imagine telling a story to a blank screen and you don't know that person. So that's it. Yeah. So how do you deal with this? And maybe you have, have, have it. Like I mean, you have your rules and what's your respect. Company. Suppose someone comes on in this and, and they constantly don't follow rules, right? How do you deal with that? How do you deal with that person? You just cut them off, tell them they can't like, participate no more or? We really have been so lucky, but I assume, I always have to assume in every moment that something like that could happen. If somebody was disruptive, I could just delete them and then they would be out. Um, when they sign up, they have to give an email. I don't know if they could give a phony email, but um, the bigger we get, the more controls we're going to put in so that you have it since you do have an email maybe there'll be another requirement i'm not sure um but then if somebody did something inappropriate we could find them and tell the authorities but we've been fortunate um and honestly everybody deserves to be heard but it's good you got a plan just in case you know you know what it people who have fantasies that the way they would like the world to be is the way it is <laughs> are messing with danger yeah um sherry next talk about the importance of empathy the importance of empathy is everything if you cannot put yourself in someone else's position then you will never be able to show them compassion, that you care, 
that you feel sad about their sadness, you feel sorry that you've hurt them, whatever those things might be. Empathy is really easier to come by when you put yourself aside. So when I'm talking to you and you're telling me something important, your story or anything else, if I am just sitting there thinking about my response, I'm not really present for you. So for me, if it's a really important conversation, I may sit with um, a pen and, and pad and hold your eye contact, but I might just have to write myself a note because I don't want to forget that and I don't want to be thinking about it. So I want to be 100% present. And if I can be as present as possible, whatever number that is, and I am also free of worrying about myself during that time because I put myself aside, then I have a pretty good chance of hearing you and trying to be able to understand, not from my assumptions, but from your perspective. Sherry, so I think we all know people out there who are out there who are like, you know, all about themselves, live in a bubble, everything's me, 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 they don't care one or anywhere else. They have no empathy, no empathy at all. Is there any kind of way to teach these people empathy and make, make them change their mindset? Or is like pretty much once you get a certain age, your personality and your way you are is the way you are? I think people do soften and get deeper as they age. Maybe not always. And I mean, I guess if you're, you know, just uh, whatever, you can fill in that blank. I, I think that... Um, it sometimes takes a life-changing experience for people to wake up. And again, it's, it depends on the things that have happened to you in your life and the messages you've gotten. But we shouldn't give up on people um, when they seem selfish unless it's severe. Because sometimes selfishness is coming from fear as opposed to not caring about the other person. Um, or as I'm saying, uh, sometimes it's, it's something that's more immature that, that they can outgrow. And honestly, if you don't give them a chance to interact with other people who are modeling a better way, how are they supposed to figure it out? So we try and really appreciate people's differences. We do have to keep boundaries. And part of mutual respect is not hogging the time, you know? Um, and it's, you know, it can be hard to say to somebody, okay, please, thank you so much, but we need to hear from some other people too, but they need to know that because not everybody's good at gauging it. From your point of view, would you say that no matter what someone does, no matter, no matter how bad it might be or how horrible, that everything can be forgivable or there's some things that cannot be forgiven? I don't think I would have the answer for anyone but myself. I think people certainly have the right to never forgive. Uh, for me, you know, something like the Holocaust, I never, I am committed to never forgetting it. So I never want to forgive it. I, I don't blame people, you know, in, in following generations or anything like that. I love all the people of the world, but it's, um, it's something, I, I don't mind living with the burden of not forgiving that. Um, so I think it's, it's everybody's choice. You know, I think we all probably know that when we can forgive someone, particularly if it's not malicious, it was a misunderstanding, or let's say it, it did have a bad intention, but the person has demonstrated amends and growth and sort of satisfied whatever they had to pay back to you or others. Um, then I, I love giving people another chance. I mean, why send people to jail if you're not going to rehabilitate and not going to give them a chance to grow and learn? A lot of people, you know, do bad things out of not knowing any other options. Yes, yes, I agree. So here's one for you. So I remember hearing this from somewhere. And the analogy was, if someone does something bad to you, it's like them taking, taking a, a nail and, you know, hammering to a fence and then they ask for forgiveness, you forgive them and that forgiveness takes the nail out. However, the hole's still on the fence. A lot of people have trouble dealing with the hole that's left over. 
I don't think there's always a hole. I think it depends on how, how serious the issue was and how well it got resolved. I believe, and here's another one of our 12 core concepts, we call it flowers and tears, and it really stands for apology. We don't get into forgiveness because as I was saying earlier, I don't think there's an answer. I think by acknowledging that forgiveness liberates us and gives a relationship another chance, there's still you know, each person's choice. But when it comes to apology, if somebody accidentally bumps you, you know, when you barely notice it, it's fine for that person to just say, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. But if somebody jams on your foot and your foot bleeds, they need to be sorrier than that. Because you, you're, you're not going to like that person if they just say, oh, I'm so sorry. And you're left there with your bleeding foot. So apology, in my opinion, has to be not just proportionate, but more. That the one who hurt the other person, intentionally or not, can't really share in that pain unless they go beyond just saying they're sorry. So what I like to do is I like to imagine what else the other person might have gone through that they didn't even tell me. Like, now you can't walk to the bus. You know, I, I don't know if you're going to be able to need a cast. You have to go to the doctor. You know, whatever those things might be. And the person might not even want to hear it in real time, might not be satisfied. It might take more than one time. But the bottom line is, depending on, on the degree of the hurt and the perception of the hurtee, <laughs> um, the apology has to be commensurate. The one caveat to that, the one cavness to that is, um, you know, there, there may be people who seem to have everything, you know, upset them. And then that's another subject. So let's suppose someone's out there and they never apologize, right? They're, they're like, you know, if I did it, I meant it. If I said it, I meant it, I'm not apologizing for anything. Is, like, is that a, like a bad mindset to have? Or is it something like happened to them in the past where they had this mindset where they never apologize? If I was their therapist, I would be very curious and happy to hear about that. But if I were their friend, I would look for another friend. <laughs> very true. So Sherry, how does one become a, a therapist? Like what kind of schooling and training do you have to do to become a, a therapist? Well, um, I'm a marriage and family therapist. So after a bachelor's degree, then there is a master's program and then after the master's program, you have to do internships and gain 3,000 literal hours of working with clients and getting supervision. So that takes another three or four years, sometimes more, depending on how quickly the person does it. Um, so it's a long haul, but if it's something you love, the time will pass anyway, and it, it's wonderful. But, you know, we have um, our cards um, are equipped with information about the 12 core concepts. It, each one, each deck has prompts and ideas for you to use. So we're actually starting a class this Saturday for 12 weeks where we take you through an in-depth look at all of the concepts, what, what they really mean, how they interrelate, what it means to work with people in a group. And by the end of those 12 weeks, you can take your deck of cards and create your own groups, um, writing groups or conversation salons, whatever you wanna do. So that's, a. I mean, I think if I were, thinking about becoming a therapist at this point. Um, and I, especially if I didn't have any of the education uh, under my belt, I think I would do something kind of no brainery to just get my feet wet and say like, do I love this, you know? Sherry, 
So do you have to do it like any kind of training, like once a year or whatever, like keep up to date on different yes. therapy things or? Yeah, you have to get 36 hours of extra training every two years. And how, how does one uh, like lose their therapy license or whatever? It's like you have to do something really bad or unethical. Yes, you have to do something unethical or criminal. Okay, all right. Um, so let's talk about something else. I think you do some volunteer work for something called City Kids Foundation. Oh yeah, uh, they're a, a wonderful sister organization in New York City. They um, were started about 40 years ago by Lori Meadoff, who's done all kinds of awesome projects. And she had created this arts program for adolescent kids who were in rough circumstances. And, <coughs> excuse me, it grew into, can you, <coughs> oh, we're streaming live? Yeah. <coughs> okay, try and match my cough, everybody. Okay, Lori Meadoff, I hope she's listening. <clears throat> so lots of those kids went on to become community leaders themselves and have had training in my work and so forth. And, it's a wonderful organization. And is it only New York City or is across the states? It's uh, no, it's it's basically New York City. And how do you how do you man? Now I'm coughing. So how do you become involved with them? How do you? I think I would go to citykids.org. Um, okay, all right. And you're you're in Santa Monica, California, right? I am. I'm also in New York, but right now we're just online. Okay. And, and were, you, were you born and raised in Santa Monica or you just moved there from New York? No, I grew up in New Jersey. Okay. <clears throat> I came to LA when I was 20. And I've been here ever since, like five years. Okay. Nice. That's a joke. Hey, like, like whatever some of our family who's a female, like, oh, is over like 30 years old, I always tell them, hey, happy anniversary. Happy anniversary of your 29th birthday. Exactly. Um, so you want to talk about the sum, but can you talk more about how uh, the narrative method got started, how the idea started, what you focus on now, what, what your vision is for it moving Definitely. forward? Um, when I finished the program in narrative medicine <clears throat> in like 2013, I, I was so moved by everything I had learned because here's this brilliant program rooted in social justice. And it's really about teaching empathy to doctors, teaching them empathy through reading literature and identifying with characters, because everybody knows what it feels like to be in a doctor's office when you don't feel like that doctor really cares about you so much, where they don't look at you, maybe they don't remember what your story is or what's wrong with you, or they think it's something else. I mean, it's so sad that that's such a common experience, but it's not because doctors are bad. Um, there are many reasons, including they had never prior been required to study how to be with patients in a way that not only makes the patient feel better in real time, but improves the rate at which they get better and improves their compliancy with the protocols. So studying all this was really inspiring, but I knew I didn't want to do something where people would have homework, you know, to read and then come back. I don't kind of want to be in a teaching situation. So I decided I was going to use videos or still pictures or short experiences in real time that people could respond to right away. And that's kind of how it started. And I just started doing it. And through doing it, it just became more and more refined. And it's honestly, it's not that far away from how it started out, except at the beginning, it lasted forever. It would be three hours or three and a half. I mean, I, I, I don't mind doing a marathon, but now it's basically one hour or an hour and 15 minutes. Um, and it's really streamlined. So you bring up a great point. I think there's a lot of people out there who like, they want to start a business. They want to, you know, learn how to play the violin. They want to know how to do whatever. 
and they always have an excuse why not to. Can you talk about the importance like you did, like of just getting started? It's really hard. Um, it's really hard because I think for a lot of people, unless you come from this exact area and you have a head start, you know people or you can come in at a higher level, it's really hard to start something that you don't even know how to describe. It's just a sense. But especially if you're starting something new, give yourself props and a lot of compassion because it's going to be a while till you get it externally. And it's hard because there are times when it's discouraging. You know, maybe like in my case, maybe a lot of people didn't show up or you would have some people, you know, giving you these responses, showing you how much they loved it. And then you would, you know, go to another place and nobody showed up. So starting something, first of all, you have to be passionate about it because you won't get through the hard times otherwise. Ask yourself why you're doing it. If it's just money, unless you are really just caring about money, if it's just money, it may not suffice for you. So it's got to sync up with something deep enough inside of you that you're going to stick it out through the hard times. Um, and then just stretch as much as you can every day, do as much as you can. And then you also have to accept that sometimes you don't know what to do. So don't quit, but just step away and work on something else when you don't know what to do. That's, hey, what's, that's, go ahead. what's your advice on this? Like, you know, a lot of people, they take things personally, right? They're like, no, they'll do some sales calls and they'll like, they get five no's. They put a job application in, you know, they'll get five no's. You know, and people take it personally, right? How do you, and is it personal? Probably not, right? Maybe the person's too busy. Maybe they emailed a spam. But a lot of people take everything, take everything personally. How do we untrain ourselves not, not to take things personally? First of all, it's hard not to because being told no is being told no. And, you know, unconsciously, your brain is not like sussing it out like, well, this person's really probably busy. It's just like, no, you can't, no, you know? But I think what we have to do is stay hyper aware to the environment. And what is the case is that this, maybe it was a cold call, the person's not available, okay, I'll try again. Or maybe the person says, no, I never wanna hear from you again. And you realize that you are not making one call. You're making a thousand calls right now. You're only making 10, let's say. But if you have a goal, that out of a thousand calls, I'd like to get, you know, 50 yeses. 50 yeses could be fantastic. A uh, hundred yeses would be 10%. So uh, let's say 20%, 50 yeses. And I don't know, maybe it takes you a year to make a thousand calls, what, whatever it is. But I think you just have to start out with a plan to soothe your frustration. If you are someone who doesn't mind selling, I don't really like selling, um, then that's to your advantage. But if you can't get someone to help you with that and you have to do it yourself, I would just say spread it out and work on some of the other things that are also essential to do. Yeah, and like I said earlier, I think you gotta take the small victories, right? Cause if you're calling people, you close your call a hundred, and in, in, in 40 answers the phone, that's a win, right? Because no one answers the phone anymore, right? So even if 40 people just answer the phone, that's kind of a win, I think, you know? Oh, I mean, that'd be amazing. But you just have to know that going in. That, you know, let's say you put in an hour. I don't know how many people you call in an hour. But if you, depending on what you're selling, but if you got a customer in an hour, that could be awesome. If you over, let's say you're going to spend 10 hours on the phone a week, that's a lot of time. That's a lot of calls. What if you got 10 people? That's a lot. So you just have to calm yourself. Think about that rocket ship, just incremental change, slow. It builds upon itself as it grows, but the it's like childhood infancy you know all those years take a long time 
and then you're five, and then you're 10, and then you're 40, <laughs> whatever. Sherry, you talked about some already, but can you give us more tips on how people can become better storytellers? I think the best way to be a good storyteller is first of all, to trust yourself and try and be in a frame of mind that you're in when you're with your best friends. That especially, I mean, look, we all know when we don't feel safe When you don't feel safe, all bets are off. Don't, don't be personal with people if you don't want to. But if you do feel safe, the more we let people see us and understand us and know us, the more we can be loved. But if we have our protective side showing, they can only love that. So I get that it can feel scary. And again, just move incrementally. The best way to tell your story is just the way you would tell it if you weren't worried about how it came out. Yes. So Sherry, you know, nowadays there's social media, everyone's on social media all the time, the phone's everywhere. But that, I think the stats show that people, the loneliness of people are, are, is at an all time high, right? Even though you know, there's all this stuff going on, everyone's saying they're more lonely than ever. Yeah. Is there a way to fix this or is this time, you know, the times we live in or that everyone's missed this pers personal connection? Well, I'm, I'm trying to do that. You know, I, I, I wish that there were places to physically go in every community where people could hang out and it didn't feel like some corny, you know, thing that some city official, you know, figured out with popcorn and, you know, punch. Um, but I, you know, that's my dream is to have the culture be just a little more relaxed and people feel natural about talking to somebody in line behind them or buying coffee for a stranger or, you know, just starting a conversation. I know it's hard in this particular climate, but we're available. I mean, I, I'm hoping that, that the human connection movement continues to grow. So Sherry, um, let's suppose someone was out there, they're passionate about something, they want to start a nonprofit. What advice you have for them to get started and, and you'll start and, and do a nonprofit? Well, the first thing is it's really hard to fund a nonprofit. So you should, first of all, ask yourself, are you going to put in the first money? And if you're not, you're going to have to raise money first, or if you're going to just do it on a shoestring. Okay. But it's not a no brainer. And you still have a lot of responsibilities in terms of taxes and the way that you do things. Certain things are stricter. You have to have a board and all that kind of stuff. So my first advice would be really look into the details. And then if it's, if it's right, then try and you know, get advice from somebody that you know who has done it or look into seeing what you can learn to, um, I, I know there are, there are all kinds of things available online um, that you could take advantage of, but I would really look for advice because there are so many nooks and crannies and the, the more you know, the, the better off you are. So Sherry, as you know, there's so many, uh, so many uh, nonprofits out there, right? Nonprofits, <laughs> literally every single thing. Let's suppose someone wants to, wants to donate some money or like volunteer the time nonprofit. Is there something shown like what the, uh, to make it simple, like is there something shown like what nonprofits are actually doing, what they say they do versus they just taking money and like you no know, high admin costs? Is there something that we're saying, okay, I'm gonna donate, you know, X amount of dollars. I know my money's gonna go to the cause versus, you know, being wasted. You know? Absolutely. That's not only the most important question, it's just so timely. There are a lot of organizations that were well respected that turned out to give like, you know, 10% of net to the people they claim to take care of. So you really do have to look into that. In our case, when we get a donation or work with a company or a school, then all of that goes to providing free zoom-ins for people. Um, plus everything that we do charge for, we keep as inexpensive as possible. Um, and I think there are plenty of organizations 
that do amazing work and give a completely reasonable amount of, of the money they raise to the, the causes that they claim to. But look into it for sure. Sherry, um, can you give us tips on how you do your fundraising? Like, how does that work? Do you have like a certain like um, client funders you go to every year, they get the same amount? Or is, is this constant, you, know, you got to call, call people, you know, how does that work for you? Um, personally, I'm the worst. I hate asking people for money. Um, and, you know, I can trace back and figure out why and share that with you. But um, somebody else does that for me. Okay. So, yeah. And how many people on your team besides you? It's really me, uh, one person, Jessa Zepper Gray, who's the head of programming, and my husband, Richard Boos, has come on board. Um, he comes to every Zoom in. He just, you know, it's really been amazing because we both love it so much. But yeah, we're a three person team. We, we are really starting to grow. And we, we have other people that we work with, but, you know, they're not part of our core team. So do you see this as something that's going to grow where you have like a, like a, almost like a franchise of this in every city? Like, how do you see your growth going on? Or are I mean, you going to, are you going to cap it once you get to a certain amount of clients? I would love it to be infinite. Um, uh, if somebody wanted to do something, you know, and they were aligned with, you know, what the project is intended to be and they wanted to franchise it, that'd be great. Um, I am always looking for partners in any part because I'm just one person and I really want this blasted all over the world. Imagine, you know, with instant translation, if you could have people from all, how'd you like to people from Ukraine, you know, right now, and that'd be amazing. Um, so yeah, I, my imagination is infinite on this. The reality will be the reality. Yes. So, Sherry, I was going to ask you next. <laughs> so, I know what it was. I got brain locked. So, when people go to your program, do they graduate? They get some certificate or anything like that? No, you never graduate. Okay. It's, it's uh, because it's not a class. Um, it, it, well, I'm, I'm, I should say the class is a class. Yes, it's, it's a 12 week course and we, we're going to be offering more and more uh, programs uh, that are training based, but the zoom ins are just, you know, no, if you like it, you come all the time you get to know people and it's, it's really community building. Uh, a lot of people, we have these people, um, ironically, there were two people from Western Canada who happened to be in the same breakout group and they met afterwards for coffee. It was like, <laughs> are you kidding? That was that's, such a great feeling. That's crazy. Without a it doubt. is. It's like magic. Yes. Um, Sherry, um, is there anything else I asked you that I didn't or anything else you want to talk about that we haven't covered yet? Um, I mean, I, I feel like we've talked about so much. I mean, the only other thing I would want to do is just really invite people from the bottom of my heart to check us out and uh, come to an event and see what you think. Sherry, uh, I forgot to ask you in, in the pre-talk, but you, do you have like any kind of gift or resource to give away? Some people do, some people don't. A what resource? Uh, yeah, some kind of resource to give. For a, what? For the, for the listeners, like a gift, a gift, resource, a discount. Oh, well, the Zoom-ins are free. So. Okay. So you can have a hundred percent off uh, ticket to one. Can't be that deal. Yeah, exactly. There's one that starts uh, tonight, Thursday, at five p.m. Pacific, eight p.m. Uh, Eastern, and everything else in between. So please come, you guys, and mention Jason. Hey, Sherry. Um, can you share your social media links for you and your company so people can reach out to you? Sure. It's the narrativemethod.org and you can go to the events page, but we are on Facebook and Instagram and all that good stuff as the narrative method. 
And to Alyssa, we'll have the, the, the link to our, to our gift and our, show, and, our, and our social media show notes. You can find our show notes at www.cabinetshlblog.com. And be sure to rate, subscribe, review the Jason Cabinet experience and share this, net, share this episode with your network. So, Sherry, we're coming into a talk. Can you give us any advice or wisdom or anything you want to talk about? I would say the most, here, I'm going to give you a little uh, self-soothing tool. When you're stressed out, this is something you could do anywhere because nobody will regard this as looking funny. <laughs> so take your dominant hand and put it firmly on your heart so that you feel your heartbeat. And <clears throat> that hand is kind of the most grown up you that just figures stuff out. However you do it, you do it. And that part of you is telling your fears, your worries. It's cool. I got it. Don't worry. But from the inside, you feel that pressure and you, you can relax because it's, it is a way to signal to your unconscious the way, you know, your mom or your dad or someone who loved you may have touched you. It's okay. You don't have to worry. And it can calm you down really fast. And I talk to myself out loud. So um, and I ask myself what I think about things and when I answer. Uh, no, really. I mean, if I'm stressed out, I'll say, it's okay, honey. Because you know what? That's kind of what you need to hear. It is. It is. Sherry, thank you for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thanks for everything you're doing. Make the world a better place. You're so sweet. Thank you for having me, Jason. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. And remember to be great every day.